I'm Shane Morris with the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. For more than 20 years, Marvin Alasky has been the editor-in-chief of World Magazine, the nation's largest Christian news magazine. But Alasky is a man of many roles. He spent 20 years as a professor of journalism at the University of Texas. He was an advisor to President George W. Bush, the provost of the King's College, and the author of more than 20 books, including The Tragedy of American Compassion, a book that's been called one of the most influential public policy works of the late 20th century. His new book is called Reforming Journalism, and it's a roadmap identifying a way forward for Christians who want to have an impact on the media, and for those of us who may not be journalists but want to understand it better. Oren Cole Smith had this conversation with Marvin Alasky to discuss both his book and today's media landscape. Marvin Alasky, first of all, welcome to the program. And I've got to say, it's a little bit intimidating interviewing you because uh, you taught me most of what I know about interviewing. And while it's not quite fair to say you wrote the book on interviewing, you certainly put a chapter on interviewing in your latest book, Reforming Journalism, which is, of course, the book that I want to spend most of our time talking about today. Well, thanks. I'm a little intimidated also because I normally listen to listening in while walking around with my wife Susan and our dog Greeley, and Greeley might be very depressed to hear my voice in such a way, but we'll just have to see how he reacts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I will be interested in Greeley's reaction to the interview. Where's that voice coming from? Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. But let's, if, since I said I wanted to you know, begin with a book, let's do, in fact, begin with a book. And your new book is Reforming Journalism. And tell me why you wrote this book and who did you have it in who did you have as the intended audience for this book? Well, I wrote a couple of books on journalism a long time ago. One back in 1988 or so and then the other a little more than 20 years ago. And I hope I have learned a few things from editing world during this period. So before I completely lost my mind, I wanted to get some of that down in paper. Well, you know, one of the things that you do near the beginning of the book that I found to be encouraging as somebody who, of course, at least attempts to practice the kind of journalism that you're talking about in this book is, if you will, your defense of journalism. You offer a raison d'etre, shall we say, for uh, Christian journalism in the beginning of the book. And one of the ways that you do that is to recount an encounter you had in a bathroom with J.I. Packer. Can you tell that story? Yes, that was intimidating. This goes back to late 1980s, where both he and I were speaking at a conference at Wheaton. We were both in the dorms. I had never met him. At least that particular dorm had a setup where there was a bedroom on one side, a bedroom on another side, a bathroom in the middle. And early one morning, we met in the bathroom brushing teeth. And I was not so much intimidated by the toothbrushing, but intimidated by the fact that later that day, he and I would be both speaking in rooms next to each other at the same time. And I thought this was a huge scheduling error by the Wheaton people because, number one, I wanted to hear J.I. Pack and I wouldn't be able to hear him, but number two, I really could not imagine that anyone with logical thinking would want to go and listen to me about journalism when they could listen to J.I. Packer on theology. So Mm -hmm. I mentioned that to him in a kind of apologetic, stumbling way, and he said what I then quote in this this book, uh, nonsense, the work of journalism is so important, and he explained exactly why. I don't remember the exact quotation offhand, but He talked about how it's both pre-evangelism and then an aid to sanctification. So pre-evangelism in the sense that people who think Christianity is just a nutty thing might be impressed that Christians actually have brains. And therefore, what we as Christians believe may be something worth worth thinking about, maybe talking Mm -hmm. about. And then an aid to sanctification in that when we have readers who are Christians reading a magazine or reading any journalism product by Christians. It helps us to think about the world God has made. It helps us to think about how we should be active following God's directions in the Bible 
to try to do as best we can in our sinful and fallen way what God would have us do. So pre-evangelism and then post-justification and aid to sanctification. So he had it theologically well described and that just stuck with me as basically our mission. We talk at World about how our mission is biblically objective journalism that informs, educates, and inspires. And it informs, educates, and inspires both non-Christians in the pre-evangelistic way, and then Christians in the aid to sanctification way that Packer spoke about. Well, I want you to unpack that expression, Marvin, biblical objectivity in just a minute, but I want to linger with J.I. Packer here for just a moment, though, because in that same section of the book where you described that encounter with him in the bathroom, you, you also wrote this. Uh, I've also remembered Packer's succinct definition of biblical faith, God saves sinners just those three words. And when I read that, and you didn't say this explicitly, but in some ways I thought, you know what, that's kind of what you do at World. That is kind of what all of the journalism that World does could almost be summarized by those three words. Number one, God. Number two, saves. In other words, God really is at work in the world, and that a journalist that is really seeking uh, to understand the truth needs to understand and look for that agency in the world. And thirdly, sinners. In other words, we really are sinners in need of a Savior, that the world is broken, that the world is fallen, and telling the truth about that reality is really important, too, for the Christian journalist. Am I reading too much into this, or am I getting it about right? No, that's about right. God saves us. And again, this is the God who rules the entire world, the entire universe, who created us. He knows what we're made of. He's not just a little God, he's a great, wonderful God. And saves, that's absolutely crucial. The old hymn, uh, Lowry's hymn, about nothing but the blood of Jesus, that really has it right. So that's saving. A world, we don't save anyone. We can provide information, maybe we can inspire sometimes, but this is really God. He's in charge, his doing. And then the hardest thing, really, of those three is to admit that we are sinners. This is... Certainly something hard for lots of people in media, but people everywhere. And maybe the reason the Bible talks so much about the poor, the unimportant in societal terms, in some ways getting closer to God is because when you're famous, when you're rich, when people kiss up to you, it's often harder to understand that that you're a sinner. So, yeah, all three of those things, Packer, that has it so succinctly, so beautifully in three words. If he were not a great theologian, he would be a great journalist. <laughs> sort of putting those two together, theology and journalism. Let me um, pivot to a phrase that you've already used uh, once in our conversation, Marvin, and that is that phrase, biblical objectivity, which in some ways is a uh, an amalgamation of the theological understanding of the world and the craft of journalism. What do you mean whenever you use that expression, biblical objectivity? Well, today we often think of an objective perspective as as one not voicing a strong opinion, neutral. I try to go back to an older understanding which equated objectivity and reality. So reporters who accurately describe reality are objective, despite being opinionated, if the reporters are exceptionally well-grounded, if they're well-informed. So the key questions to ask of a reporter, are we gonna trust the reporter or not? Well, how do you become well-grounded? Have you seen close up what you describe or are you just peering from a distance? So you look at Psalm 24, verse one, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. So that verse, like every verse in the Bible is true, God made everything and everyone, and so he knows every atom in the universe and in us. I'm speaking here from the new, very bare bones studio that my friend and colleague Nick Eicher has set up in my house. So this is in my hill house in Austin, Texas, and the builder of this house left me the blueprints. The builder of our world, God, left us the Bible. So when we want to know the objective nature of our world, we study his blueprint. And again, 
biblical objectivity goes against the conventional understanding of objectivity these days, which tends to be, well, a balancing of subjectivity. You quote from person one, you quote from person two, and somewhere the reporter is neutral and readers are then expected to be able to discern between one and two. But neither of them may actually be describing reality objectively as God knows it. And we, as fallen sinners, don't know it. But when we read the Bible, when we apply the Bible, on some things we can come closer, far closer than we would if we were just going, working off our own brains. And so that's our goal, not to consider ourselves wise and not even to be wise by ourselves, but to reflect God's wisdom as best in our limited and fallen and often sinful way we can. Well, Marvin, on page 17 of your new book, Reforming Journalism, you write this. A Christian journalist is one who not only goes to church on Sunday, but believes that Christ rules 24-7. A Christian journalist trusts the biblical message that God created the world and is active in the life of his creation. So what you're describing there, it sounds to me, is that objective reality and that the Christian journalist any journalist who is really seeking the truth, whether he knows it's uh, coming from a Christian worldview or not, is one that is looking for that reality whenever he looks out into the world. Fair or not fair? Fair. It has been so much of a blessing for me for 27 years now in editing world to be able to, all through the day, try to be thinking what does the Bible say about this? What can we learn from the Bible? How can we apply the Bible? And that's very different from even some Christian journalists who report things, not all that different from the way a secular person would report things, but then tack on a Bible verse at the end. My wife and I have had some experience talking with Chinese Christian journalists, and they have a very, very hard job right now. But a lot of them were trained essentially in Marxist journalism or some other form of secular journalism. And then they became Christians. And the hard thing in teaching is to be saying it's not just looking at things in this particular way and dropping in a Bible verse here or there, but your whole product becomes changed in the process as you're thinking biblically. In a way, it's like the difference between a, a salad and a uh, cake mix. Amy Sherman has used this analogy in terms of programs that are thoroughly Christian, that this anti-poverty programs, Christian ministers that are thoroughly Christian are more, they're a mix. It's all, the Christian part is all the way through as opposed to a salad where you can pick out maybe a couple of croutons or something like that. I suspect the same thing works in journalism. What we try to do at World is provide the mix all the way through the article, not necessarily by quoting a Bible verse, but all the way through the article, we're trying to approach this in biblical objectivity. And that's very different from a salad story where you have all these elements which are pretty conventional, and then you just drop in here or there a particular biblical reference. Marvin, since you introduced the idea of Marxist journalism. I want to pivot just a bit in our conversation and ask you to describe O&O journalism. You talked about biblical objectivity, which is the kind of objectivity that you strive for and that world strives for, an objectivity that bears witness to the reality of the world, to um, you know the world as it really is, the world that is truly there. The other O, if that's one O, uh, biblical objectivity, two other O's are oppressive journalism, or in other words, a form of journalism that views the world through the lens of the oppressed, and the official account. Uh, you call that O&O &O in your book. Can you say more about that? Well, sure, because I do mention that in chapter one, and then the last third of the book, the last 10 chapters, go into the history. And I'll have to just try to real quickly give you an overview of American journalism history starts out with the official story. This is back in colonial days. The job of the journalist was to make the king or the royal governor look good. So he was basically doing public relations for the top officials, and that was the official story. There was a very brave man named John Peter Zenger in 1735 
who fought back against the official story because he had a biblical understanding of what journalism should be in terms of telling the truth. And there was a very sensational court trial. He eventually was able to go free. But in the process, he started developing and then others followed in not doing the official story, but emphasizing what is really phase two in American journalism, the corruption story. Namely, as we learn in the Bible, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all corrupt. And that includes officials. So the job is not to do public relations and make the official look good. The job is to tell the truth. And in telling the truth, expose the sin that's in officials, that's in all of us, and then try to propose ways, report things so that people can do better. That was the dominant understanding in journalism from beginning in 1735 with Zenger all the way for another 100, maybe 125 years or so. That changes starting in the second half of the 19th century into what I call the oppression story. Namely that we by nature are good. In fact, we're not just good, we're, we're pretty wonderful. The problem though is a societal institution. It might be capitalism, it might be church, it might be different types of food, it might be eating meat, it might be all kinds of things, but nevertheless, it's not the sin within us that causes the problem, but it's something external to us. And that oppresses us in some ways, and the goal is to get rid of the oppressive force. Again, whether it's business or this or this or this or other types of things, that's the goal. We are good, society is evil, institutions are evil, get rid of the institutions, and we will be, then be free to be the wonderful people we really are. So that's phase three. We had moved from the official story to the corruption story to the oppression story. What's come about in the past few decades is the O and O. It's a combination of official story and oppression story. Namely, there is widespread oppression in society, but government officials or the right government officials will deal with that by taking away the power of corporations or making sure that churches are put in their place. So maybe you can worship for an hour on Sunday, but you can't have it working the other uh, 167 hours of the week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The government people are our friends. The president, if he's the right president, is our friend. So it's a combination of the official story and the oppression story. And that's a very convenient thing for journalists in lots of ways, because as opposed to being a rebel, you can actually enjoy all the perks of power and access, but at the same time feel very righteous in helping people, helping society emerge from oppression. So O and O is the predominant type of mainstream journalism right now. And uh, one of the things we do at World is try to say that that emperor is naked and we need to have biblical clothes. Well, you know, Marvin, I don't want to wander too far afield in our conversation, but your little history of American journalism really, in many ways, explains what's going on in our politics today, what's going on in our culture today, what's going on in philosophy and in the academy today. It really explains uh, political correctness. It explains the kind of virtue signaling that we often see from our politicians where they will jump on a, a particular bandwagon that um, might be um, popular uh, with the electorate it explains a great deal, doesn't it? Well, I think so. And you're right. It's not just journalism. There's the expression in academia about tenured radicals. That's a great position to be in for the individual, but it's not really good for the society. What we're really seeing now, and this is a sad and potentially very dangerous development, is the polarization of the press. Not that the journalism of several decades ago, which was kind of a moderate liberalism, there wasn't much diversity of viewpoints. There were three networks and you watched those and you got pretty much the same thing. That wasn't a great situation because it really wasn't truth telling. But in some ways our situation now is more perilous because you have the New York Times and the Washington Post have really figured out the way to make money by being advocates of particular positions on the left, and even more so being attack dogs against the folks they don't like on the right. I find Fox News 
a little better than those, and I'm glad that Fox News is there to provide some alternative, but Fox in many ways does the same thing with public relations for people on the right and being an attack dog against people on the left. Now, discussion like that is good, debate is good, but when you start turning opponents into enemies, that's when societies get into big trouble. My favorite novel is by a Spanish author, Jose Hiranea, called The Cypresses Believe in God, which is about the five years before the Spanish Civil War from 1931 to 1936. And then the war was three years in length and left half a million or a million dead. I am not at all suggesting we're at that point in America right now. It's still a matter of words, not sticks and stones. But the troubling thing is that over a period of decades, words can become sticks and stones. And we are in a very dangerous course right now as you have a polarization of journalism not just debating, not just thinking about opponents and let's discuss this and figure out better ways, but where other people turn into enemies, permanent enemies, and you're basically out not just to win a debate, but destroy your opponents who you now see as enemies. Well, Marvin, it seems to me that uh, that pathology that you just described, this uh, pathology of treating our opponents as enemies, is wrong, at least in part, because it fails to take into account the biblical idea that we're all made in the image of God, we're made in the Imago Dei, and that we should treat each other with dignity and respect, even when we disagree with each other. And once again, that's a pathology that I see not just in journalism, but in the culture at large. Well, that's right. And yeah, we are all created after God's image. There are individuals who turn away and disgrace that image, but still, God saves sinners, and God may indeed be saving people who we think of as utterly obnoxious. So we want to be open to that. When we report on issues where the Bible is clear, we don't try to balance, for example, on abortion. We do not try to balance the, uh, the views of pro-life people with pro-abort people. It is an evil thing that those people are doing, but... Number one, we always want to, in a feature, let's say, on abortion, we want to quote accurately, let's say, someone on the pro-abortion side, perhaps from Planned Parenthood. We want our readers to understand how some of these folks are thinking and why they're saying what they say and taking the positions they take. So that's part of biblical objectivity, being fair to even people who do just about the worst things in society, such as killing babies doesn't mean we balance, but it does mean that we try to be accurate in what we describe, including describing what this creature in the womb is like. And we try to be accurate in telling why these folks are doing this terrible thing. And at the same time, we want to be indicating that much like uh, Bernie Nathanson from a generation ago, much like some other recent emigres from Planned Parenthood who have come over and are now leading pro-life organizations, we want to say don't assume that God's arm is too short because he may be changing a life right in front of us, God save sinners. So that's what biblical objectivity is. We're trying to describe things as best we can from what the Bible says. And we are also thinking, and not just thinking but writing, that yes, everyone is made in God's image and no one, in our knowledge, is someone who is unsavable because God is a mighty and wonderful and gracious God. Shane Morris here again. We're taking a quick break from today's conversation with Marvin Alasky to remind you that today's podcast and all the other great work we do here at the Colson Center wouldn't be possible without the generous support of listeners like you. If you're a regular supporter of the Colson Center, I want to take this moment to thank you. If you're not, I would like to learn more about how you can partner with us in our work for the gospel. Go to breakpoint.org and click on the Donate tab at the top of the page. Thanks for letting me jump in here with this quick break. And now, let's get back to the Colson Center's Warren Cole Smith and his conversation with World Magazine's Marvin Alasky. Well, Marvin, if biblical objectivity is the goal, 
of Christian journalism. And if uh, biblical objectivity and those who practice that kind of journalism are standing against O and O journalism, if that's sort of a fundamental conflict or dichotomy here, I'd like to drill down uh, a little bit below that sort of that headline there and move into the story itself and ask specifically how world does that? What are some of the tools and techniques that uh, world does uh, the world uses to do that. And one of the uh, tools and techniques that you describe at some length in your book is uh, this idea of biblical sensationalism or sensational facts, but understated prose. Those two ideas kind of go together. Can you say more about both of them? Well, sure. A lot of the facts of the world are sensational. And when you read the Bible, there are a lot of sensational elements. Now, that can be either a tale of sound and fury told by idiots or it can be in the way the Bible uses sensations to show us this is really important, pay attention, here's what happens when you act in one way, here's what happens when you act in another way. So the biblical stories are often very sensational. They get our hearts racing, perhaps, if we're really paying attention. They get our minds certainly moving. They're not something that puts us to sleep. But at the same time, we're always emphasizing the way God works and the way God acts in the world. Now, yeah, to get down to street level, and we often talk about we try to do street level, not sweet level journalism. We let me take a controversial issue on something where a particular Bible position isn't utterly clear, and that's why there's such a debate about it and a debate among our readers. Uh, immigration. We have tried to sympathize both with refugees who are desperate to enter the U.S and also sympathize with readers who insist on the rule of law. So we try to look at street level. We want to see this crisis at the border up close. So we send reporters to spend many days on the U.S.-Mexico border. We try to understand what the Bible says about, about both law and about generosity. And we try to see what the people at the border are fleeing from. So, you know, last year we had an article on bloody Honduras. I mean, that's the Central American country from which many of the recent immigrants are fleeing, refugees. And we're going to send our uh, terrific frequent cover story writer, Jamie Dean, back to Honduras because we really want to find out among those fleeing, is the level of crime and violence so high there that the U.S. will be enabling murder if we just say no. My wife and I were driving through Central America five years ago. I saw guards with automatic weapons stationed in front of convenience stores in Honduras. So that's an indication of how violent the society is, but I really don't know how hard life there has become. So we don't just, at sweet level, talk about this in generalities. We're actually... Jamie's going to go to Honduras. I, I hope all our listeners will pray for safety for her. But, you know, she is warm-hearted but tough-minded, and it's a look at reality. Mm-hmm. So that's biblical objectivity, trying to see what it's actually like at street level, informed by a biblical understanding that we should be welcoming those in great danger. I mean, I feel this personally. I mean, as you know, Warren, I'm from a Jewish background. I became a Christian purely through God's grace when I was 26. And so... The history that I've studied in the 1930s and 1940s, before World War II began, the U.S. turned away lots of people, particularly Jews, trying to escape from Hitler. And many of them later died in concentration camps. And many Christians since then have certainly regretted that denial. So as Christians, we don't want to be in a position where we're going to be regretting folks who are legitimate refugees just stuck there in a process where they are likely to be killed. But it's a tough, tough question. We're not going to say that someone who disagrees with us on this, and again, we tend in the world to be pro-refugee. Rule of law, yes, but the U.S. has a haven for people who are running to us to save their lives and the lives of their families. That's been the tradition. So we're part of that tradition, But we're not saying that Christians who disagree with us are evil people or nasty people. It's a tough call. 
And the way you deal with tough calls is by actually going at street level and finding out what's going on and then trying to make an informed biblical judgment on it. See, we have a metaphor that we use because our business headquarters are in Asheville, North Carolina. There's a lot of whitewater, really good whitewater rafting about 50 miles west of that. And we've taken students from when we had our World Journalism Institute, when we had our World Journalism Institute classes in Asheville, we took them onto the rapids and as to understand this metaphor that some issues are like going gently down the stream. They're class one rapids. They're easy to navigate. It doesn't mean they're easy issues, but we know what the Bible says. We know what the Bible says about abortion. We know what the Bible says about LGBTQ issues. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to know exactly how to act in every political situation, but we know what the Bible says. And then you go all the other way. You go the other way far to very dangerous whitewater rapids where basically you're, you're going over a waterfall and you're probably going to be dead. We call those class six rapids. And on those, we are not going to be insisting, well, here's a biblical view. It's very, very difficult. It's a class six because there's no clear biblical understanding. Where are you going to locate a particular highway? What are you going to decide on some of these trade issues involving tariffs and so forth? We're not going to say, here's a biblical position. Anyone who's not with us is wrong on that because the Bible isn't clear. So there's a whole gradation. When the Bible is clear, we want to be very clear. We want to report at street level, but we want to clearly indicate by the people we interview, the way we report things, who becomes the face of the story. We want to indicate, yeah, here's a biblical position. And then it becomes increasingly difficult. And I won't go here for interest of time. I won't go rapids by rapids. But we have biweekly phone conferences where all our reporters are talking. And sometimes we will actually be saying, okay, where does this issue fall? How are we going to come at it? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go to make sure we're operating at street level? So it's a very practical mechanism we have for trying to report with biblical objectivity. Well, of course, Marvin, as you know, I've, I've been in those editorial meetings, and you're precisely right. I mean, we will actually sometimes ask you, well, Marvin, what is this, <laughs> a class two or a class three or a class four rapids? And sometimes we don't know. Sometimes, or you, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes it's not obvious. But I agree with you that it is an enormously helpful metaphor. And it's one of a number of tools that you use at World. We've already talked about this notion of uh, sensational facts and understated prose. You talked about street level versus suite level reporting. You've introduced the idea of the rapids. And let me just stipulate for the record and for our listeners that we can't talk about all of the tools and techniques and metaphors that you use in the, in, that you describe in the book. So go get the book, go read the book. But Marvin, I do want, before we pass on, to ask you about one or two more. And one of them is this idea of the uns, that you say that part of the responsibility of World Magazine and Christian journalists generally is to speak for the uns. Can you say more about that? Well, sure. It starts with the unborn. They are tiny, powerless human beings. We are on their side. We're not going to say, well, there's that and there's this and so forth. We are on their side. And one of the things, as my wife and I have been involved in the pro-life movement for 30 years, we have seen more and more the way being on their side is also the way being on their mother's side, even if sometimes the mothers don't at first realize that. So the unborn, the uneducated, you know, people on the left like to talk about structural injustices in American society. And I don't see the free market system as a structural injustice. In fact, it's a powerful tool to help all kinds of people move forward. But there is a structural injustice in our society of schooling. There are lots of kids who are trapped in really bad inner city urban schools. And maybe there are sometimes options, but they tend to be expensive options. So one of the things we have been consistently for over the past 30 years is educational choice. Opportunity for people who are poor to be able to have kids go to better schools. But for a whole lot of reasons, that's still not the way our society, for the most part, works. So the uneducated, yes, there is individual reasons for that at times, but there is also societal reasons. And that would be a situation insofar as we, I think we know what works 
with education and forcing kids into one poor performing public school is certainly not just. So we are for those kids who are stuck there. We are for the unemployed when they have been laid off, factories closed, and that's why this whole issue of tariffs is so important and critical. So these are people who are being treated in some ways through no fault of their own, whether it's unborn kids or uneducated kids in inner city schools or people who are unemployed because the plant closed and the stuff's now being made in Vietnam or China. These are people, we are on their side. At the same time, we try to understand economics. We try to understand the difficulties. We try not to simplify things. So a lot of these questions are complicated, but our fundamental perspective is biblical objectivity and we start from there, and then we delve into the complexities and try not to just think we're so smart, but talk to people who are legitimately, truly experts. We have learned that lots of experts don't live in Washington, D.C. or New York, and in fact, sometimes that may actually lead them into the temptation to kiss up to the powerful and avoid the truth. So we've learned a lot of things over the years in journalism, and yeah, this, this book is just an attempt to convey to folks what we've learned. So we use it in our World Journalism Institute classes for college students, for mid-career people, citizen journalists. Uh, my wife and I train 10 people at a time in our living room downstairs. And if you look at the world masthead, our list of folks who write for World, just about everyone under age 40 at least has gone through WJI and a lot of people older too. So, you know, we try to do a lot of things to educate not only our readers, but educate ourselves in what biblical objectivity is all about. Marvin, I'd like to um, take the remaining time that we have uh, in our conversation to do what you often told me to do (laughs) whenever I wrote for you, and I know you tell others, and that is to climb down the ladder of abstraction a bit. That, you know, we've been talking about these ideas, but I'm sitting here with a copy of of world, the latest issue, at least the latest issue as you and I are having this conversation, which has troubled ministries on the cover, and a cover story written by Michael Renault, who went through the World Journalism Institute mid-career course. And I just want to talk to you a bit about some of the stories in here and just ask you how these stories exemplify these ideas that we've been talking about. So let's start right here, the troubled ministries. How does the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability hold them accountable? is the deckhead or the subhead on that story. Is this an example of what you were talking about earlier of not telling the official story, even the official evangelical story, but digging a little deeper and trying to speak truth to power? Exactly. We enjoy, I suppose, that may be too strong a word, but we like, when we see a problem in secular society, we like to be able to educate our readers about that. But if we were to ignore the stuff on our own side, evangelical society, then we would be going against the biblical understanding that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So my hope is that for every investigative story about a Christian organization, we'll have at least one about non-Christian organizations or governmental programs, sometimes because a lot of Christian journalists don't do this, people come to us We hear about situations. These are sometimes people who have worked in organizations or people who have just seen that those organizations are not doing what they should be doing. And in this particular story, it's called the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. So it's something that should hold organizations financially accountable. And as we researched this at street level, we found out that often it doesn't. And we want our readers to know about this. And we hope that our readers will clamor for the folks who talk about financial accountability to hold organizations accountable. And we hope the people within the organization will do a better job. The folks at ECFA are not at all our enemies. They're not even our opponents. They are people we hope to challenge. And that's what we often want to do with Christian organizations. Our goal is not to hurt them. Our goal is to help them by pointing out, here are the pressures you faced and here's sometimes how you've fallen into bad practices, and we want to help you do better. 
that's a hard thing at times because people think we are picking too much on organizations that are already being picked at by government, but our goal is to, I suppose, as Packer would say in an aid to sanctification, to help all of us and ourselves to act consistently in the way we learn in the book of Daniel and many other places to act. And that's looking at God first and not accepting any substitutes and realizing that it's only by the blood of Jesus that we can be saved. Well, it strikes me too, Marvin, that this kind of a story is an example of looking after, advocating for the uns of the world, the um, folks that may not have the kind of access that reporters at World Magazine would have, donors, the people who are served by these Christian ministries that maybe possibly wouldn't be served as well. Uh, as they might otherwise be if these ministries were stronger and doing a better job. So indirectly, you are helping the uns, and very directly, you are helping our brothers in Christ, I guess, be stronger in the work that God has called them to do. Yeah, that's very well phrased. There are lots of small donors who want to know that when they send $20 or $50 to a ministry, they are often sacrificially cutting into their own budgets. They want to know it's being used well. And that's what the ECFA should do. It really should be a seal of approval and a confidence builder. And we hope it will will be that. Well, you know, Marvin, as I look through this issue that I have in front of me, I don't know if this is the best example of a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about, but it's certainly a really, really good example. And also gives me an opportunity to say good things about Mindy Bells. The article, Help is Still Maybe, in brackets, on the way. And then the subhead or the deckhead for that article reads, an entrenched aid machine in Washington is endangering a post-ISIS comeback for Iraq's Christians and Yazidis and a big success story for the Trump administration. This story has everything. I mean, it has uh, you're advocating for the uns, you're speaking truth to power, you're pushing against the official story. It's street level reporting and not sweet level reporting because of course Mindy's been to the Middle East many times to, and knows of what she is speak of writing here. I mean it's got a little bit of everything that we talked about. Well yes, Mindy is wonderful. She knows that terrain so well and she doggedly keeps asking questions and pointing out things. Uh, she knows the people who live there. She cares about the people. They are certainly uns in that situation. So yeah, as Editing this whole thing, I really like that we can go back to back with an organization that points out problems with an issue that points out problems in a Christian organization and then right away points out problems of governmental programs. That's our goal to look at both. We don't want to, even though we get all these leads about problems in Christian organizations, we have to be somewhat selective in what we investigate and we never want to just become the inspector of Christian groups and ignore what goes on in these big governmental programs. So our goal is really to do both. Well, Marvin, you and I have had many conversations on these issues over the years, and they've all been uh, very nourishing to me. And I could sit here and uh, talk about these ideas all day long with you. But unfortunately, our time is very quickly drawing to an end. And I just wanted to try to, uh, if, if if you'll allow me to use this metaphor, land the airplane by asking this question. It's highly likely that of all the things that you have done in life, uh, an advisor to presidents, uh, the author of dozens of important books on American culture and uh, journalism, that at least one of the lines in your obituary is going to be a longtime editor-in-chief of World Magazine. Given that, how do you want to be remembered as the longtime editor-in-chief? Uh, especially someone who has written a lot about journalism history, and you've had an opportunity to assess the editorship of others over the years. And secondly, how do you want world to be remembered? How do you, what kind of a role do you want world to play in the culture? Good questions. Uh, first of all, God is the editor-in-chief, and I certainly know that I am not God. So I think I want to be remembered as a sinner saved by grace, Someone saved by God's unmerited mercy. Nothing I've done deserves the God, the kindness God has given me, both in being able to edit World all these years and, and really enjoy the people. We have lots of interns who live with us for a while, and I'm very fond of all of them. 
So I really like the people. I like the work that goes on every day. It is a great pleasure to be able to wake up in the morning eager to get to work and to go to bed at night regretting only that there aren't more hours in the day. So this is a great kindness from God. That's how I want to be remembered, as a, a sinner saved by grace, God's unmerited mercy. The particular things, yeah, I, I hope world will be able to show people what biblical objectivity is all about. And Warren, you may remember there was once a fellow in North Carolina who tried to set up local Christian newspapers with names like Charlotte World and so forth. That, of course, was I remember you. that guy. Yeah, I, I remember I that, guy. that guy. Yeah. So I'm still hopeful that maybe that will happen too, that as we show that this can be done on a national basis and, you know, we do have jobs, we do have food on our table, I'm hoping that there will be local journalists, editors who try to create magazines, newspapers, websites uh, covering their own, what's going on in their own cities. So that's been a long-term goal. We're still far away from it. But I hope world will, will be around for a long time. And the vehicle may change. That I love this magazine. I, I love editing the stories. I enjoy the whole process. And I, again, the people in it. But we also have this growing podcast. And that's a lot of fun to listen to. And who knows? I'm hoping that the magazine will last a long time. I have some of our older readers who, reading things in the newspapers about the decline of stuff on paper, and they ask, you know, is world going to be around over the next 10 years or so? And I can certainly wave a copy in the air, like Neville Chamberlain, and say, peace in our time. It'll still be here during this period. But I don't know what, what it'll be like in 20 years or 50 years. So the vehicles may change, but the storytelling remains the same. And the emphasis on, on street-level stuff... Maybe I can close, if you have a minute, with just one story recently, what I learned. Absolutely, yep. I, back um, a week and a half ago, I spent a delightful hour with a professor at Rice University, Jim Tour. He's one of the world's most published chemists. And I was asking him, well, we have these polls that show 97% of scientists support macroevolution, macroevolution defined as, as new body plans at the level of the phylum. How can that be? If 97% of the scientists are saying one thing, how can you be saying something else? And Tour explained that, that what he's often said to proponents of macroevolution, in essence, is show me the chemistry. He's a chemistry professor. And when he says show me the chemistry, show me how one thing actually change into something else at this molecular level. And no one's made able to do so. So, you know, this is something I'll be writing about this. What he was telling me reminds me of the, the academic solution to get out of a pit, you know, a pit with tall, sleek walls that are impossible to climb. What's the academic answer? Assume a ladder. And that's what he finds. In a world, again, street level means don't assume that there's a way out of this you have to be able to show how this works. And I think in Christianity, we can show how this works. God saves sinners. But, you know, with macroevolution, if we just assume that life just emerged, and as Jim Tour would say, you know, we don't show how, how it can actually work chemically, well, then we are substituting faith in evolution for biblical objectivity, which has a logical explanation, God created life. So that's the basis. God's in charge. God owns World Magazine. God owns any books that you or you and I have written. They're all his. And our job is to learn from him and look to his wisdom and not what we might think is our own. Well, Marvin, thank you so much for this time, for being on the program, and also just for your career and for all of the uh, time and energy and work that you've poured into me over the years. It's been uh, so nourishing and helpful, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Well, I'm grateful to you, Warren, and grateful to God for both of us. So thank you. That was Marvin Alasky of World Magazine. His new book is called Reforming Journalism. As Marvin and Warren discussed, the freedoms of press and speech are vital for a free and functioning democracy. That's why the nation's founding fathers embedded these freedoms in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Another vital freedom, a freedom also specifically enumerated in the First Amendment, is the freedom of religion. That's why, before we go, 
I'd like to remind you that the Colson Center is offering a book this month that explores in more depth the vital freedom of religion. Free to Believe is a powerful new book by Luke Goodrich, an attorney for the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, where he's represented Hobby Lobby and Little Sisters of the Poor for the United States Supreme Court. You can get this new book by Luke Goodrich by going to breakpoint.org slash book and making a donation of any size to Breakpoint and the Colson Center. Again, that's breakpoint.org slash book. Thanks for listening to today's Breakpoint podcast. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.